Well, welcome to a, another Business Today TV show where we talk to some leading business people right here in Perth, Western Australia, sharing all their advice. And particularly this week, Gerard, they're sharing all the hints and tips to help people get through this COVID-19 crisis. I think all the help you can get from people that's been through some of these things before is always worth listening to. And as you can see, we're in separate studios because we're doing the social distancing, which is really weird for us. But let's get into the show. Well, welcome to the show. We're social distancing. How are you going downstairs there, Gerard? Lonely. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> this is really weird. We're having to switch cameras, do double screen. It's, it's, it's really, really weird. But look, this week's show, Gerard, we're talking to uh, a lot of business people, getting their strategies on how they're overcoming this COVID-19 crisis. I think everybody's been affected by this COVID-19. I think this is normally when there's a disaster somewhere in the world is to a specific area, uh, but this pandemic is just worldwide. So anybody you speak to has been affected. So people this week are sharing their uh, strategies for going through. Now we've got Hilliard coming on the show straight up front and she's going to give us the number one quality that successful people use, Gerard, not just in crisis, but um, all the time. When you study successful people, and you read their books, and you listen to some interviews on YouTube, it's amazing that all of them had this one specific quality that came through. Listen to this. The, the successful people, as we know, they, they show it in their action that how much money they help they always, you know, to give it to charity or they have their own foundation um, you know, to help people in third world countries or people who are going through disasters or educating others. They are doing the best of they could. And, and this is not about that, okay, they will love their money, they are successful, they want to hold on to their money. No, they use their money for, to make it, to create a better life for everyone. For them, success is something becomes natural part of them, and the money is an inevitable part of success. That's the problem. People focus on money so much, they don't realize that first you need to put on work before you expect the money come in. That's why they say first you need to learn before you earn. So th there is no other way. So once you become to that level, once you become that much successful, you're happy to give your money back to the community and help others because you are not only wealthy you have that up here in your brain you know how to create more wealth again I know there are many people who don't like Donald Trump he's not a favorite character of many people but we all have to admit that he is the guy that even though he went bankrupt in a couple of years time he made more money than before so and these are this shows that the mentality of the person, the successful person, that how they see things and how they are able to rise, no matter whether it's after bankruptcy or at any problem, again they can come back and actually more stronger. Well, Gerard, what great advice there by Helia and. I think she was really spot on that number one quality is driven by giving. We've seen it so many times, all these successful people, they all have charities that they support. Um, and I think it also becomes part of their legacy. Uh, it's not about the money anymore. Mm. And I think even when they're getting to their success, even my counselors, we're building, we do a lot of giving. You can join us on uh, Worthington Stoop. You get a lot of free information. And that's what we give as well, isn't it? We, we give these TV shows and, and try and bring that information to people. It is all about education. It, um, sometimes people don't have the time to go and read a book or listen to you to um, a two, three hour long uh, videos. And by listening to us, it's short um, introduction, short strategies that you can implement. Now, one thing that Helia said was that um, in another conversation we had where she was talking about the importance of story. And I think we start hearing people talk about that. And she went and caught up with Andrew Ford, another one of our guests. And she was trying to show the power of sharing your story, sharing your journey, as it were, not just not the why, 
but your actual story so people get to know I like, can trust you a bit better this was an interesting one Gerard well, I always uh, say you know that facts tell but stories sell so tell me about your business I mean when did you start this business yeah we were very young and I'm um, very yeah, inexperienced so I'd, I'd left school at year 10 I uh, did an apprenticeship in refrigeration and air conditioning so a tradie and I'd met my still current business partner Kyle at one of the hospitals where I was finished my apprenticeship and this time I'm age 19 and it was automatic that yeah. an apprentice leaves the employ to make way for the next mm -hmm. apprentice so I had to look for a job and that's when we concocted a ill-conceived plan of um, going and starting our own thing. Oh wow that's a great story. So is it, it's been always nice and easy? You met your business partner or your friend and you started business? And it's never easy, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Has ups and downs, so, yeah. especially in our industry because it's so seasonal, needless to say, with refrigeration and air conditioning. And we did refrigeration back then as well, cool rooms and even mm -hmm. people's fridges. Nevertheless, it was very, very seasonal. So it was a real feast or famine situation. So the first summer, you'd be guaranteed you've got enough work in summertime. But the first winter time came around and there wasn't enough work for two of us. There wasn't enough work for one of us, really. So Kyle left the business and went back to his old employer and just did the winter there. So that then took wow. the burden of having to support two of us. Um, and I got through the first winter just doing odd jobs, labouring. Obviously, yeah. when a service call came in, we were just doing service work only then. Um, I'd obviously go and attend to that. And then the second summer came around and we started to get a bit more momentum. And then from that point on, the business supported two of us. Wow, that's a great story. Yeah. So, but if we go back and see that, okay, how is your mindset was around this business setup that you had with your friend? Yeah, it was, I suppose being that young, we didn't know what we didn't know. So that was both a blessing and a curse. So the, the good things about being so young was I was still living at home. So my outgoings or overheads personally were very low. So I didn't have enough mortgages to make, car repayments, kids, all that sort of thing, which puts a mountain of pressure on you. So if I could live on a couple hundred dollars a week. So that was good, so we could leave the, the money in the business. Um, but what, of course, what we didn't know is we, we just didn't have the experience. So we learned very, very quickly as one does when you're burning your own money and making mistakes mm -hmm. that cost you money. So we learned very quickly and again, a negative at the time was that we looked so young because we were so young and that didn't give us the credibility that we needed. And especially when we started to get into selling the air conditioning and not just servicing it because we quickly realised selling just time, mm -hmm. as we know unless you're a lawyer or an accountant or something, earning five, six hundred dollars an hour, it's very hard to scale that up past a certain mm -hmm. level because there's only so many hours in the day and only people paying so much per hour. So we realised that to make more money and more wealth, we had to sell something and air conditioning was a high ticket item especially back then, it's actually cheaper now than what it was way back then to put in ducted air conditioning, for example. So when we then, we then changed direction, pivoted the business into the sales side of it, and that's when we really sort of got the momentum going. But going back to my point, we were so young, we actually grew beards to make ourselves look a bit older, <laughs> to give us a bit of credibility. Because wow. people were spending $10,000 on a system or something, yeah. and these two younger looking guys, are they gonna be around in a yeah. week's time? Are they gonna take the money? So this gave us a bit of credibility. Now I don't dare grow, I'm just too grey, <laughs> but um, another story again. Oh wow, that's, that's a great story again. Well that was something different for the show. Now, we actually took that from Helia's uh, YouTube channel, so you can look at Helia's thing on uh, YouTube and see the rest of that interview her and Andrew did together. I, I just found it fascinating. I found how he worked through the, the struggles interesting as well, just didn't give up. I think people think business is easy. Well, if it was easy, everybody would be in business. And there's certain qualities in successful business people um, in their story that you can learn from and just never give up. I do think that success leaves clues. Now, one of the things I like about trying to get those clues for ourselves is people's attitudes. And Gerard, you have your famous 60 second question. You ask them a question, they can't go over 60 seconds, they've got to answer it. So you j and you give them no warning, <laughs> you just have that camera, ask them a question. And I think success leaves clues can be seen really clearly. What, what question do you have for them this week? So this week's question is, why is tracking your cash flow important to you? Tracking cash flow, without knowing what my cash flow is, I can't pay people, I can't pay staff, I can't pay myself. So I've got to understand where my money's coming from, where it's going to, to be able to make sure that I've got a balanced budget within the company and be able to track the company along 
where it needs to be and have it survive. After 32 years, it doesn't just happen on its own. It needs to be tracked. Well, cash flow is king, isn't it? Because without cash flow, it doesn't matter how much income you may have. If there is not enough cash flow to know when it's coming, you may not be able to cover your other expenses. So that's why cash flow is the first thing any business or any individual need to learn through their budgeting, and which we really, really can help people to get the best budgeting, whether it's for their business or their for individual life. Close the crux. It's really the cash flow is king. Uh, if you don't know where the cash flow on your business is going out and go broke, uh, if you track your cash flow and you keep an eye on your numbers, when you're making an error in your business, you'll see it very, very early and you can turn it around and stop it, stop doing that, stop the leak. Tracking cash flow is important, not only to me, to everyone. Look, cash and the cash flow is the blood and oxygen of the business. If you do not track cash flow, then obviously the businesses will not survive. In fact, uh, might, you know, the biggest uh, reason why a lot of businesses fail is not because of profitability, it is because of cash flow. So it, it, it is very important. I monitor it very tightly in my business. Well, I, I do love your 60 second questions, Duran. <laughs> you really put them under the pressure, but they just seem to be able to just answer off the top of their heads. Like it, it's inbuilt into their DNA. I think it's so important, the lesson that I've learned as well is that, you know, everybody talks about profits in the bottom line, but if you don't have the cash in the bank, it actually doesn't matter. No, and I think it's one of the things that Nittany even always says, you know, we have One Minute Millionaire where we give one minute strategies. We take a millionaire strategy and deliver it within a minute. And that's so you can just grasp that, that key concept and then start to apply it. And then, of course, we've got the millionaire program itself built on the back of that. That link will be underneath, by the way, and we're doing a, a very special discount on it during this period. Uh, but that's the application of those strategies. One Minute Millionaire is gives you that key strategy and build. And I think that's what your 60 second questions is all about. Let's get that key strategy. Let's hear it from a few different people and see if there's some commonalities, some, um, as we said, success leaves clues. And I think that's why it works so well, that, that particular segment. And every week we get some golden nuggets from these people. The, 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 the important part for you is, is take that golden nugget and do something with it. Implement it in your business. See where you can implement. This is one of these strategies and you will see the change in your business. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I love doing these live shows. They are a bit of a, even more challenging. I keep going to look at you, Gerard, and realize you're not there. <laughs> so, if someone keeps seeing me slightly turn my head, that's what's going on. Hey, we'd like to know your strategies. What key strategies? Put your comments underneath. Have you got any questions for us? Put them underneath. And one thing about COVID-19 and oh, any problem, sometimes plans don't go to plan. And we caught up with uh, Peter McLernan about this to get his attitude on it, Gerard. Again, if business was easy, everybody would be in it. You can always have a plan, but you have to be ready when things go wrong, that you have the support, that you have somebody that you can brainstorm with to change your plans to move forward. Yes, so just prior to the virus hitting us, I was working down a path of expansion for the business, you know and looking at um, an innovative way of um, expanding without taking on debt. So, mm. so uh, uh, I looked at um, business migration as a possibility, you know, and rather than franchising. I think franchising in a lot of ways has run its course. Um, there's a lot of legal, uh, it's very, very expensive to set up to begin with. It's very expensive, yeah. and it, the books that come are more like war and peace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's complicated, and there's a lot of legal, you know, yes. new, you inventing new legal um, agreements, you know, yes. to describe different businesses and so on. So you know, and and they can come undone. Mm. Um, so I thought, well, we've already got the, um, you know, the company law. Uh, in Australia, so yeah. it's fully structured, it's been tested over time and so on, so rather than have some structure that has to be built externally, we have used the existing company laws and company structure in Australia, so, so what we do is we'd sell shares, for example, rather than sell a franchise or a you know, percentage, and, you know. so 
the idea was then to set up a, a company, individual companies in each state. So yeah. um, then it becomes a partnership uh, in a company. Part, half of the shares owned by an investor and mm. half owned by the central company. Now, I, I haven't seen this <laughs> being done anywhere before. But one of the things I look at that, you get coronavirus coming now and you're just about to implement this new growth strategy mm. and it gets stopped. But you mm. had a lot of interest. Mm. What are the strategies around keeping the interest and keeping that model in place so mm. when we're past this, mm. you can reignite it again? Yeah. Well, um, I had a group of investors interested um, mm. and they were about to take the physical step of coming and looking at the business and so on and then looking at how, you know, how it might be expand the structure might be expanded and so on. We'd spent probably two years on background work getting ready for that you know, internally, you know. And um, the, so what I'm doing in the meantime is keeping in touch with those people, you know, um, and uh, letting them know how we're going in the meantime. I think this would be a good test of the business actually. If the business comes out, which I anticipate it will, reasonably strong at the end of this, that's going to be a good indication of you know, how it's going to go in the expansion phase. You know? And I think the expansion, um, as I was saying, we, might be, we may not be harmed by this when it comes to expanding because similar businesses in other states you know, may struggle. So that would create an opportunity for us to either form partnerships with those people and help them out of that situation mm. or purchase the business at a reasonable price or take over a customer database, for example, and make our expansion you know, much more, and speed up our expansion. Because the intention originally was to start a new business there in competition. Mm. Yeah. So for you, when things like this happen, and you've been in business for a long time, so you've mm. seen a few of these things. Maybe mm. this is more serious than others, who knows? Yep. But your idea is when they happen, you instantly go back and start re-strategizing mm. and looking at, okay, the what ifs of the whole thing mm. and finding where new pathways or better pathways may be. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, problems create opportunities, you know. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's another one that I thought of as well, <laughs> which might we might mention here, and that is that I'm actually an auctioneer, and um, another one of my businesses is um, um, Auction Perth. It has its own website, so that's McLaren's Auctions Perth. You know, so I've been an auctioneer for a second-hand dealer for probably thirty or forty years. You know, um, so I anticipate that those people who do want to close their businesses or may have to close their businesses, uh, the rate of that's probably going to increase over the next, you know, um, three or four months. Mm. So that will create opportunities, you know, whether we like it or not, for liquidations and all that type of thing, and therefore for the auction business. And there's an onlo complete online auction uh, business there. So, yeah. um, you know, we're currently communicating with liquidators and accountants and so on in relation to assisting in those circumstances. You know, I often, and listening to you, I hear your attitudes and often we're told attitudes determine mm. altitude. Mm. How does someone like yourself stay positive mm. when there's something coming in mm. that for a lot of people they go, um, mm. it's over, but not for yep. you. Where, yep. where does that, how do you keep positive? I think it's probably time in the game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, um, you know, you're continuously confronted by ups and downs. So, you know, um, this is just a, a, you know, a down, it's a temporary condition. So you just have a look at the circumstances and see what, you know, what, you know, what, positives, what positives are in there that you can actually take advantage of, you know, during that time. So, yeah. Well, it's really interesting doing a, a live show in two separate studios. You know, I've got my camera working, you've got your camera working. I'm trying to control everything. And, and down here, I've got the actual switcher to go and uh, play the interviews. <laughs> <laughs> recorded Gerard. <laughs> How are you finding it? I must say it's uh, challenging, <laughs> but again, I think we learn new skills. Absolutely, and I think that's what happens at times like this. You do learn new skills. I think it also gives you time to reflect and maybe reframe your business. We, we call it reframing. It's not restructuring, you're not throwing everything, you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as they say, 
but you are reframing and have a look at your assets, what you've got in place. And it is a time for you, good time now to actually reflect and do that, Gerard. But it's all about attitude as well. Mm. Yeah, you can have an attitude to say, you know, that if you listen to the news, that is the end of the world. Or you can have the attitude to say, you know what, this is a time now for me to do things better and to innovate. Um, everybody say, when are we going to back, go back to normal? But do we really want that as normal again? Do we really want to do exactly the same? So this is actually a good time to reset everything in your business. Place that these questions. And, but again, it's about your attitude. And you know, I've seen wishy-washy values all over the place. We're accurate, we're honest, you know, we, we respect you as a customer. It's like yeah, and I actually caught up with Alex from the mentoring effect and said, look, attitude it's like anything in business, are they actionable? So I got to ask her the question what really are values? What are values all about and what should they be? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm here with Alex and the mentoring effect. We're having a bit of a smile. We, we did last time we talked about why and we just, we were just talking about values and I went, oh, turn the cameras on, turn the cameras on, we're in the <laughs> studio. So we thought we'd throw it on and do something completely off the cuff and talk about values. I'm going to go right off the mark here and say, I believe a business is when it has values. Values control the behavior of their staff. That's the only reason to have values. You can tell I'm ex-military. <laughs> oh, really? I couldn't guess. <laughs> <laughs> but let's have a look at values for a business because you work with team building, you work with mentorship, you help people discover their whys. When it comes to values, what's your take on it and what's your perspective? First of all, I agree. The values are very important and uh, driving you mm -hmm. as well as a person, as a business owner or employee or uh, as, a, as a parent. And that means any, any values, uh, you, should be, you should be clear on your values. That's why I'm always telling people, just try to think about that what is important for you because if you will, will be in a time pressure and you have to make big decision, the first thing that should come up to your mind, it's like, okay, what is my value? What is my first biggest value? That means if you have something that is going on in your business and life, and you know you have to make big decision, the first thing should be, for example, for me, family is the first value and it's most important. That means if somebody will tell me like, oh, you will suffer and you are not going to see your family because you need to do that, I will probably say, no, family is more important and I promise my weekends are going to be free and I'm going to spend them with family. And it will be a decision. That means all decisions and choices are changing. And that's why it's important. So you're using your values to help you make decisions that are aligned with what you want to achieve in your life. It is important even in business or mm. in team because uh, it, they, are, they should be aligned. I know a lot of people have different values for the business and organization because they are kind of out of the organization, mm -hmm. but a lot of people still working as a solo trader, small businesses, and they are still face of the business. They represent the business. Yes. And if you represent the health business and um, you are 50 kilo overweight, overweight, probably something is wrong there. That means you really try to align with your business, with your personal values and business values. I agree, big organizations should have their own values because they run all hundreds of people and teams based on that. Do you find that within, just talk quickly about large organizations, that different departments have different values or are they just one set of values for the entire company? That's a good question. Um, there is a company and they, they have, uh, for example, four or five values they're very clear on and mm. it's the same for everyone. I was going to that number. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's usually like we, we played with free, but there's a lot of companies that have like a five major values. Yeah. It is important in all departments because when you when you do trainings, when you do team buildings, when you do any any activities, you need to know what you or hiring sessions. You need to know what you are actually teaching people or what you want to tell them or how you want to kind of model them a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. if, if I, I was mentioning communication or thrive in the change, you want to put them in a situation that is something risky and they they're under pressure and they need to make decisions. You want to see them, how they react. And you want to have great people there in your team. They can yes. actually react, you know, how you want and how you expect. And you can't change that because everybody is on the, you know, when you interview people, they're yes. like, oh, I'm great under pressure. I'm really, I'm achieving great results when I'm under stress. And you go, and you, you go into the training and team building yes. and you see people under the pressure. And <laughs> 
and it's so it's it's funny not funny probably for them but yeah. i always say like yep that's the great result under pressure so with the values it's interesting you, you said you know you've mentioned the number three that's probably one of my favorite numbers for values but then you said uh, some of the companies have uh, four or five of them for we talked about the bigger companies but a small startup is it just as important for the small business owner to have to be really clear on their values and how do you help them get it or discover them yeah oh, that's funny because i can compare myself i didn't have any idea about values when i set up my first business i didn't have any business plan i was just doing things and it became mess right. that means that's why I'm, I'm probably some people make fun it's like oh you have business plan or you know business coach and it's not about that Mm. I really want to know what I would like to, where I'm heading, what I would like to achieve. And people around me and working with me, they should know as well, because that's the direction. It's yeah. like you're driving the taxi or someone next to you is telling you like, oh, take me to CBD. Mm. And you will just drive around CBD, per CBD, but you don't know the final destination, how you can get there. You will never come to the 63 Adelaide yeah. or somewhere, you know, you just can't when you don't have a mm. dress. And that's the final destination you should have. And that's why I'm saying like probably values, your beliefs, your mission and vision, vision should be all together as a base, like a strong base for your business. So you know when you reach your destination. Yes. <laughs> and you know how to get there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Alex, the mentor in fact, thank you so much for joining us again. <laughs> thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> well, Alex and what uh, values should really be, Gerard. That was, that was a fascinating call. Oh, by the way, that was recorded before social distancing, before anyone jumps up and says, yeah, take Klaus. <laughs> Everybody knows my stance on, on your why and your value. If you don't have that cemented in, you can have difficulty in managing your business, especially when you build and, and, and grow your business. Yeah, um, my attitude is, you know, I'm ex-military, so my attitude is your values control behavior. How do you want your staff to behave? How do you want your customers to behave? How do you want your suppliers to behave? And I think that's what you should really be building your values around. This is how we expect you to behave. That's our value. So that's that's my take on, on that particular one, Gerard. And I know you're very strong that your values actually do come out of, out of your why. Because if you don't have a good, strong why, then you're not going to have good, strong values. But again, if you have your why and your values, you need to show people it. It's mm. no use you to tell people you know about your values, but they can't see it in your actions and they can't see it in your business. And I think that is one of the things. And I think listening to other people and respecting that we caught up with Colin James. He's Mr. Facebook here in Perth and uh, you can talk to Colin. And he talks and he's actually changed us a little bit. Uh, we didn't have any groups uh, before doing this show, especially on the TV show. And talking to Colin, he tells us the importance of you as a business, on your business page, having at least one group attached to one of your business pages. Let's have a listen to Colin. Well, we're back with uh, Colin. Mr. Facebook, you get called in Perth here. Last time we had you in, Colin, you talked about groups and you left us with the key message that if you've got a business and a business page, you must have a group under that business page. Correct. And it's, look, it's really, really simple. When we're talking about groups and group interactions, if you have a page in your personal profile, People can't really interact on your page or your personal profile, but in a group they can, which means that you can create a lot of conversation in that group and get people to interact with you so that you can have a running commentary about your business, about current affairs, about community uh, things that are going on, and that gets more people following that group which then gives you more people who are going to interact with your business. A few of the groups that I've joined, and they seem like they've got some pretty strict rules, um, some that I disagree with because <laughs> it stops me doing stuff. <laughs> and some I go, okay, I get that. How do you decide the rules for group? Do you have any advice on this? Be, be strict. Um, make sure your group, the group that you run, is controlled by you so that you control what goes on your group. And it's, it's simple. Um, if you don't want people to be promoting certain businesses on that group, then say so in the rules. Um, if you don't want people to be uh, uh, promoting 
your belly button flat, um, whatever, or anything like that, then say in the, in the rules, you say none of this. You can do this, but you can't do that. Be strict and stick to it so that your business page, your business group, sticks on and sticks with the ethos of your business. Now, there's a couple of groups that I'm in, and I do postings, obviously, for the TV show, but I've got to wait for the group's administrator to approve it. Yep. Is that something you recommend? Make sure you're approving each post? Yes. You approve the post. If you've got three or four people in your business, make them administrators or, or um, monitors of the, of, the, of the group so that you can control what goes on that group. Otherwise, you're going to have situations where you're going to have, you know, you can make a million dollars overnight uh, being advertised on your group and you don't want it, then you have to go back and delete it. Um, also get people to report problems that are occurring in the group to you, not to Facebook, because then you can control what's going on, um, which allows you to um, monitor and control without disadvantaging uh, people who are posting to the group who, and they've just made a mistake. You say something interesting there. How do you in, how do you get people to report the problem to you, not to Facebook? You just put it in your rules. Right, you just okay. ask them, please report this to admin. Uh, and and when people can do that, if it's a if it's a controlled group, when you go to report something, it'll it'll actually say to you, report to admin and not report to Facebook. When we report stuff to Facebook, you're reporting it to an algorithm. Yes. And, and Facebook act on everything in, a, in an algorithm. I mean, if you had a business that was, uh, had 2.6 billion users, you would use an algorithm to do all this stuff too. Otherwise, you'd have to employ about 2.6 billion people um, to see all the complaints and the things that are coming in. So if you have them report it to you, then you can make a judgment on that post using your ethos and the ethos of your business and the rules that you've put in place on, on your Facebook group to allow you to monitor that and control what's going on. Comment, I'm conscious of your time, but as we leave this and someone is going to set up a group under their business page today, what's one or two pieces of advice you'd say, do this so you get it right from the start? Um, just think about it. Look at what other people have done don't reinvent the wheel. Go and have a look at a group that you sort of go, well, this is something I post in. It seems to work very well. Uh, there's nothing wrong with ringing someone up and saying, hey, can you give me a little bit of a pointer on how you did this? You can ring me. I'll certainly give you a pointer on how to do it. Um, it's not hard. You just press the create button, create group, and away you go. And I suppose at the end of the day, if someone said, Colin, is it worth the effort? What will it give me? It gives you more people to follow your business and your business page. And at the end of the day, that means you're gonna have more people seeing your product and give them an opportunity to be buying from you instead of your competitor. Well, there we go, Gerard. So we're gonna step out of this studio and uh, I think you've already put the group together. I think it's brand new. So the people here watching the show, come and join us on our group. We're gonna be having more in-depth topics, giving great free information on the really the education. So I'm actually quite excited. I was really glad we actually pre-recorded that with Colin and it's enabled us to build the group before we've actually gone to air today. It's all about innovation, making things better. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. Now, I know one of the things that when struggles hit you, Gerard, that um, cash flow becomes a, a problem or lack of money becomes a problem. And some of the people that can help you, like accountants, we tend to shy away from because we're frightened of uh, the, the fees we might have to pay. I think this is one of those situations where it's not going to cost you money to see your accountant, it might actually save you money if you go and see your accountant. I can make you money. At this particular point in time, I think they can make you some money as well. One thing, I'm going to make a comment here, John. I'm actually getting to pick up when you're stopping talking so I can speak, and, and I notice you're picking up my little clues. Oh, from, we get <laughs> not being in the same room. It is more challenging than what it looks, I can tell you. And there's buttons and things going on all over the place. Hope you're enjoying the show. Look, if you've got any questions for us, you've got anything you want help with, 
And look, we, we are opening ourselves up. So if someone wants to call us, I'm going to put the phone number below for us. Uh, email. I might just put the email. That might make it easier because sometimes if we are recording, we don't answer the phone. So I'll put the e big email on underneath it. Just send it and say, look, I'd like a chat and tell us what your business struggle is and let's have a chat about it. No obligation, no fees, no nothing because we do understand that money is tight. But it's also important to see your accountant as well, Gerard. Exactly. And uh, the next six segment um, is just about Nit and talking about why it's important to go and see your accountant. Hi, well, we're back with Nitten from the tax store in Osborne Park. Hi, how are you, Nitten? Oh, hi, thanks, Michael. Uh, social distancing, we're in opposite studios at the moment. Yes. But I think at the moment, businesses are going through a challenging time. And I'm finding some of us saying they can't afford to go and talk to their accountant. This is starting, they're getting a little bit nervy about the cash flow you've talked about. What are you saying to your clients right now? Uh, look, uh, um, first, uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's easier than ever to talk to your accountants and your consultants, I must say. I, mean, I for example, am doing Zoom meetings with my clients uh, all the time. I, I've spoken to clients as far in Geraldton, even in uh, regions. Uh, the clients who normally would have uh, found uh, it uh, difficult to travel to my office because they were too busy. Uh, I'm having Zoom meetings with them all the time and giving them advice on cash flow and answering their questions. So it's easy to still uh, talk to your uh, consultants and accountants. And one of the things what I'm finding, Michael, is that it is uh, uh, helping us find new ways of connecting to the clients and talking. Obviously, social distancing is important, but it doesn't mean we remain, uh, we do not remain connected and there is technology available. I'm running meetings through Zoom very, very successfully. And one thing it has done for my own business, Michael, it has forced me to use Zoom, uh, use video conferencing, and to use the technology, which uh, earlier always is kept on to the back burner because you could meet clients face to face. And I'm seeing slowly that my productivity is uh, on the rise with that. One thing I do like about you and your practice, Nitin, a lot of accountants at this stage are talking cut costs, do this, do that. But you're advising your clients now to look at new ways of selling. You're very passionate about this and saying this is something they need to really focus on. Look, absolutely. We need to find new ways of uh, doing things uh, to respond to the new realities. Look, the last thing we want is uh, to to disconnect with the world uh, and disconnect with our clients uh, and disconnect with the, our friends we don't uh, need to so but there are new ways to connect with the clients and and we need to use that I, i'm actually enjoying having meetings with my clients uh, uh, from my home and uh, and look, it can be really fun to have a really professional meeting via video conferencing while being half dressed. Nitin, <laughs> <laughs> just if someone was struggling now in business, I know there's a wide variety of them. What are your top two or three tips now for the business owner who may just be a bit stuck, a bit overwhelmed, and find it hard to break through? Look, Michael, this is definitely a stressful time uh, for businesses uh, and uh, because it has come on to everyone a little bit too suddenly and, and everyone has to recalibrate uh, themselves. And, and I can very much understand that uh, the business owners can struggle through the phase. And what I would say is uh, uh, look at your cash flow, guys. Watch your cash flow. Uh, there is a, a government stimulus uh, at uh, hand. Uh, use that if you qualify for that. Uh, uh, there is a, a separate uh, program we have done with some cash flow tips. Uh, do that. Uh, cut cost where as you can, but but rather cut uh, wastage. You know, if you have to lay a star of staff, uh, be mindful that uh, you probably will need them back again in uh, six months uh, time. So do it a little bit carefully and find alternate ways of connecting to your clients and, and giving them uh, advice. Well, great advice there by Nitin. Look, he's always available for advice as well. Look, he's not charging. 
And I think, and we're, we're following his lead on that. And that's why our email is underneath. Just send us an email, say what business you're in, uh, what is your current challenge and give you a call. We'll call you and we'll set that time up and absolutely no charge. And look, if we need Nick on the call as well, I know he's going to be very open to that. Now, we were fortunate that the, well, the governments have been bringing out their incentives, the job keeper program, Gerard, and we actually got Nitin in because he's, he's right on top of this and putting it in layman's terms and he talks about business owners, you know, employees, self-employed that might even think they're missing out. He knows the strategy to get the self-employed their money as well through his JobKeeper program. It's always government, always when I introduce these things, it always sounds easy um, until you start doing and, and going into the systems and then you see, actually, I need somebody. With Nitin, he actually explains so well when you can play. So we're going out with the show with Nitin talking about the latest government updates on JobKeeper. He came into the studio, we recorded that just recently. So we're gonna replay that segment for you. Thank you so much for joining us. Put your questions, put your comments, hit the like and share it with everybody. You know, the more people get on this, join our new group, the Business Show TV Show group. I'm getting all tongue-tied. That's what happens when you go live, Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're in the other studio laughing, <laughs> but uh, please put that in. Look, if you want to hand with your business, uh, drop us that email. We'll set the timer and we'll give you 10, 15 minutes and see if we can do a quick strategy session with you on that. And that's it for me, Drive. We're going out with uh, Nitin. So that's goodbye from me. And stay safe. Uh, yes, uh, Michael. Look, when we had the last uh, program, uh, we said that uh, for the job keeper, the reduction in turnover test that your turnover has reduced by 30 percent is uh, one of uh, the key tests for mm. businesses to qualify but there was not much clarity about how this reduction in turnover is going to be assessed by ATO yeah. now we have got a lot of details and fine prints of that and effectively uh, the way it is going to be working is that uh, we can assess uh, a business's uh, forecast turnover for a seven months period from March to September and compare it with the corresponding month in 2019. And if this turnover, this forecast turnover is less than 30% in any of these seven months, then you qualify for the whole period of the scheme. Can I just no, no, I am hearing you right. So I've got seven months, and if one of those months drops below 30%, I get a reduction of 30%, just in one month, I qualify just the money for that month or for the whole program no, itself? For the whole program itself, uh, you qualify. And, and look, for example, uh, you might uh, uh, estimate that your turnover for July 2020 is going to be... 30% reduced compared to July 2019, then you qualify for all the seven periods, all the seven months uh, of the JobKeeper scheme. And look, that is fair because a lot of people might not see a reduction in turnover immediately. Uh, it might, uh, you might still have a pipeline, but it might just gradually go down. Yeah. So, so you are in for all seven months. And Michael, what's more is that there are two more periods allowed. So let's say you don't qualify with any of these seven months. Mm. So you can compare it with two quarters. That is July, uh, April, May, June quarter, or July, August, or September quarter, and compare it with the same quarter in 2019. So mm. even if you qualify because your turnover in any of these two quarters was less than 30%, uh, then you still qualify for the whole scheme. So I, I understand by having a look at the ATO site at the moment, they, this is all up and live on the ATO now to do the applications. Correct. It, it does seem that if you are a business with employees, um, this is probably a very good time to come and talk to your tax <laughs> agent or someone like yourself to make sure you get this right because they, they, they do stipulate on there that they are going to test it and you've got to be truthful and, and accurate to the best of your ability. Oh, absolutely, because uh, the ATU enrollments are live up and running from yesterday. Uh, mm. There are uh, strict monthly reporting requirements, Michael. Mm. So every month the business have to report uh, what was their turnover for uh, uh, that month yeah. uh, and also what is their forecast turnover for the next month. 
Uh, now, I, you did mention this on the other show about double dipping. I just want to clarify this for employees. And I understand they've now released the form for you to get your employees to sign to Absolutely. say that they are going to claim the 1500 through you and not through any other business. Yes, so the employee, uh, each employer has to take a declaration, a written declaration from the employees uh, saying that they qualify, that they are above 16 years old, they are Australian citizens, permanent residents, and they are not going to be nominating for the JobKeeper scheme with any other employer. And what's more, Michael, uh, once uh, uh, that claim has been lodged, the employer has to, in writing, uh, uh, inform the employee that they have been nominated by them in the JobKeeper scheme. Wow, that is really, really good information. Yes. Now, I did have a question come through the other day for you, Nitin. It might be a bit about a sequence. I know you've got a lot to cover today, but it was startups, and they're stressing that they started their business and may not be able to compare these months to the last years because they, they just weren't, they weren't operating. Oh, yes, Michael, I think it's a very important question and a lot of people have asked us even after we did the last uh, program, mm -hmm. we had a lot of questions coming in that what happens uh, with the startups because they might not have any turnover in the previous period in 2019. So ATU has clarified that and I think it is, it is good news for a lot of startups. So what the ATU has said that if you are a startup starting from 1st of October uh, 2019, which basically means that you do not have any of those periods uh, to compare your turnover against, uh, ATO has the discretion to allow an alternate method of assessment of reduced turnover. Now, what it is going to be, it depends on a case-to-case -case basis. Yeah. So, if, uh, so I would suggest speak to your accountant and uh, mm -hmm. if there is a, a case uh, for you, uh, we can apply to ATO. And, and ask for an alternate test yeah. and you might still qualify. Well, I've spoken to a few people who've had conversations with the ATO and considering the amount of pressure and workload they're under, the, the information I'm getting back is the ATO are being very, very helpful. They're really Absolutely. stepping up to the mark Absolutely. And, and really going out of their way to, to assist people. So it's not something to be nervous about, but I think someone like yourself or your tax agent is, is really, really close. They understand the languages to use as well. Yes. No, absolutely. I think the startups are, startups are not out of the game, but, mm. uh, but depending upon their own circumstances, uh, they can definitely apply to ATO uh, for an alternate test. You know? But again, it has to be taken on a case-to-case -case basis.